Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for today's Lunch and Learn with the Doctors on Understanding Pancreatic Cancer. My name is Kathy Churn and I am a Consumer Health Librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by Regional Cancer Care Associates Central Jersey Division, Princeton Radiation Oncology, Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, St. Peter's University Hospital, and the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Today's speakers are Dr. Arkady Broder, gastroenterologist and chief of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at St. Peter's Healthcare System, Dr. Tim Kennedy, surgical oncologist and associate professor, Division of Surgical Oncology at Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, Dr. Josh Pepic, radiation oncologist, Princeton Radiation Oncology, and Dr. Jim Salwitz, medical oncologist and hematologist. Regional Cancer Care Associates, Central Jersey. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Please keep your microphones muted and your webcams off. The recording will be available at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. The doctors will answer questions at the end of the talk. The doctors will not be able to offer personal medical advice to attendees during this program. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to the doctors. Good morning or afternoon. Hi, Jim Salowitz. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is very interesting that on this day we're uh, talking about pancreatic cancer after the death of Alex Trebek early this week. I've had multiple other uh, most patients that we're talking to about other medical issues reach out to me this week and just reassure them that they don't have pancreatic cancer. Um, the, his loss, I think, shows how devastating this disease is. Um, it shows the challenge in treating it, um, even with the best possible care. It shows that we have a long way to go. Um, but it's reasonable that we talk about this disease um, because there is a lot happening. Uh, there is a lot to learn. And as we go forward and then we do more research and discovery, uh, it, it helps us all to understand better what's going on. By the way, I hope all of you are safe. Briefly, as an introduction, you know, you notice there are four of us speaking today. And the reason is if there, if there ever is an illness that is a multi-specialty illness, it is this disease. I mean, it is a disease that combines multiple different doctors or different disciplines uh, working together. And I could add multiple other sorts of doctors to this list also that are not that need to be involved. Uh, it is that doctors working as a team, coordinating together. Many patients find dealing with this kind of illness that they're seeing being sent all over the place, talking to lots of different people. Um, and that's because it is a complicated illness that is best handled in a multidisciplinary uh, team by people that are, have worked together, um, know the illness. Um, and that's why you see this presenting this uh, way today. So there are many different pieces of this. Um, it is a confusing illness because of all the different ways you can come at this. And we'll hopefully give you a kind of an overview today get a gut feeling of what's going on with the disease. Topics we're gonna to discuss today, we'll talk about screening and who's at risk. We will talk about you know, the process of working it up, staging it, finding it, treatment of you know, minimal disease, uh, treatment of locally advanced disease. Uh, we'll look at the uh, treatment of disease that is spread, metastatic, and I'll talk a little bit about controlling the symptoms of the disease. If you look at the slide ahead of you, um, just to give you a feeling of why this is such a challenging uh, illness, you see where the pancreas lies. You know, it's tucked in the left upper corner back of the abdomen and coming across. It's in the crook of the small bowel. It's behind the stomach. It's just below the liver. It's got blood vessels and everything, which not have seen on this slide. Um, and it's all in this very tight area. And one of the problems is there are basically no nerves in this area. You don't feel your pancreas on a day-to-day -day basis. So things can happen there without you ever knowing what's going on. And unfortunately, because of it's tucked, tucked so many other uh, organs, it can get into other organs before we ever have any symptoms. And this is the challenge. And you can also see in the tightness of this area, how challenging it is to treat in the middle of all these other tissues and organs around it. Next slide, please. So again, this is a silent disease. Unfortunately, it does present uh, in an advanced form in a large number of patients. Um, it has only about a 25% uh, long-term uh, survival uh, with the disease because of this. Um, symptoms, you know, which you, know, you see here, um, frequently occur uh, late in the illness. So by the time you have symptoms, you may be you know, having serious problems with the disease has already touched some other organ around it in the time you really have ongoing pain or weight loss or jaundice or develop, you know, di new diabetes. 
Uh, there, there are various family risks, and I know Dr. Broder or the chair will talk about this a little bit more. Um, there are genetic risks uh, for this, you know, uh, that can increase the risk of disease. Simply having a primary relative, mother, father, sibling, increases in the risk. But most uh, are, are not familial. Uh, most are not familiar. Um, there is an increased risk with smoking. There is an increased risk of uh, obesity and perhaps with diabetes itself. Um, a chronic pancreatitis uh, with multiple pancreatic cysts, and these things do increase the risk. Um, but again, for many patients, it just occurs in the, in, a, in the absence of obvious major risk, although obviously eating better, controlling these can decrease the disease. Um, one of the problem you know, we have is how do you screen it and how, and, how do, and how do we find it? And we have some of these technologies, ultrasound, MRI, ERCP, these are blood tests, um, which can be used, but is not really useful in the general population. So we have a challenge in screening. Next slide, please. So again, we use a combined approach and I therefore that's why we're together today. And I think we'll start today in talking about you know, staging and finding it you know, you know, by talking to an expert, a gastroenterologist, and I'll turn this over to Dr. Arkady Broder. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salitz. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Th thank you for that uh, great overview. Um, I won't I won't spend um, much time in the next couple of slides, but just to reiterate uh, what, what you had already said, which is the anatomy is really, really highly complex, and the location of the pancreas is sort of deep inside, um, uh, behind the stomach. Uh, sort of buried in there with many smaller structures in the area with lots of potential for trouble with tumor growth or, or even uh, early spread because of all the structures um, around it, making the, the job that much harder for, for our surgeons sometimes. Um, next slide, please. I often get uh, questions from my patients about what, what does a pancreas do anyway? Can I live without a pancreas? Um, and uh, in general, um, I think it falls into two main categories. The pancreas has an endocrine role where it makes different hormones, uh, particularly insulin uh, would fall into uh, uh, sometimes that, uh, that uh, category uh, that you may have heard of, and an exocrine role which uh, secretes pancreatic enzymes that help with uh, digestion of uh, various enzymes. Uh, next slide, please. So, I was thinking, um, you know, how to best uh, present uh, the topic of a gastroenterologist role uh, in pancreatic cancer um, and, and yet make it somewhat interesting. And for me, at least, I learned best going through real, real life cases. So uh, I thought I could share with, uh, with the group today uh, some real cases. Um, it's a, more of a historical fiction, I'd say. Maybe some of the details are not 100%, but pretty close. Um, and so uh, uh, the first case, uh, I'd like to mention is uh, uh, Mrs. CR. Uh, this is a 83 year old woman. She had a history of uh, well-controlled diabetes and uh, blood pressure um, and uh, was being evaluated for a kidney stone in an emergency room where they noticed uh, a small cyst in the pancreas. A cyst is like a small fluid pocket. But because she had a history in her family of pancreatic cancer, uh, they decided to do some further evaluation and a biopsy of the cyst was performed. Unfortunately, the cyst came back with early stage pancreatic cancer and the patient did go on to treatment. Um, on the other hand, uh, because it was caught as such early stage, something really quite unusual, um, ultimately she survived another 10 years despite her diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, something that that could be quite uncommon and uh, succumbed at the age of 95 to leukemia. And this person uh, you can fact check was Charlotte Ray, a uh, famous uh, actress from the Facts of Life and Different Strokes who passed just a few years ago, uh, but had, had, had uh, this kind of progression of her pancreatic cancer disease. So this is a, is a good lead point into discussing endoscopic ultrasound. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. And, 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 and um, its role in pancreatic cysts. Um, you can just uh, flip through it if you don't mind. Uh, there's a, a few numbers there. Yep, thank you. Just to the end of it. Uh, but when, when we talk about cysts, not every cyst uh, is, is the same. And uh, these cysts come in different shapes and sizes and locations and, 
and forms. Um, and without really going into the detail, uh, that's not critical for today. Um, I just uh, think, um, uh, you know, suffice it to say that, that uh, th these cysts could be completely benign, like you see the, the pseudocyst uh, in the picture to uh, highly pre-malignant, uh, like a main duct IPMN. I think we received a question before the talk about somebody who has an IPMN or, or a question about an IPMN. And um, IPMNs uh, vary in location. Some involve the main pancreas duct and some involve a branch of the duct. And those that involve the main duct are the highest risk for cancer, but even the branch ones have some risk. As you could see, uh, it ranges anywhere from two to 25% in the side and uh, up to 80% or so in the main duct. Uh, that could be quite dangerous. Next slide, please. So once we find a cyst or this suspicious lesion, just like in the case of Charlotte Ray, uh, we need to get a biopsy. We need to sample the fluid, sample the tissue to see what, uh, what type of cyst uh, this might be. And um, that could be done with a type of endoscopy called an endoscopic ultrasound. You see down below the representation of what it is. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of it or have, have uh, had one yourself, perhaps. Um, uh, an endoscopy is done while you're asleep. We use a thin camera tube to go down into the stomach. And then using the ultrasound portion of this tube, we could see behind the stomach at that narrow area we've described earlier in the anatomy to evaluate the pancreas, any abnormality in the pancreas, and then take biopsy at the same time with a needle that goes through the scope and into the pancreas tissue. And next slide, please. Um, endoscopic ultrasound really uh, today has become the primary uh, uh, tool we use to diagnose definitively pancreatic cancer um, or to evaluate uh, lesions like cysts that are suspicious potentially for pancreatic cancer. It really works uh, very well and um, uh, some of the detail in terms of the operating characteristic is very impressive. It's uh, certainly the most uh, sensitive way to, uh, to definitively diagnose pancreatic cancer and pancreatic cysts. Next slide, please. Yeah, you can keep going, thank you. Um, just to, on this topic, uh, a, a general overview, uh, very commonly you will hear uh, about, just like in our story, uh, a CAT scan that may be done uh, before, before the diagnosis and that, still is, is, is a useful tool to get a sense of uh, what we're dealing with in the pancreas and even what stage of disease we might be dealing with. But ultimately the endoscopic ultrasound is what we use to get a clearer sense of whether the patient will go to surgery, to Dr. Kennedy to, to operate on or, or Dr. Sowitz and um, uh, to give chemotherapy first. Um, and that can be done with endoscopic ultrasound and again, to get the biopsy that we, we spoke about uh, earlier. Next slide, please. So our next uh, patient is uh, Mr. P.S. He's a 56-year-old man. He has a long history of smoking and alcohol abuse, risk factors we spoke about earlier that can uh, lead to development of pancreatic cancer. Unfortunately for him, he developed some vague stomach pain and then yellowness of his skin and eyes, something we call jaundice and uh, eventually wound up undergoing a CAT scan that showed a mass in his pancreas blocking up the drainage to his, his uh, gallbladder and his liver called the bile duct. That's that green structure we saw earlier on the anatomy uh, image. He then went for his endoscopic ultrasound uh, expectedly and got a biopsy that proved this was in fact pancreatic cancer uh, that then led to something called an ERCP, which I'll discuss in a moment, uh, that allowed placement of a stent, uh, uh, a prosthetic device like a thin tube within the tumor across the blockage to allow the liver to drain for him to then go on to treatment like chemotherapy and or, or radiation. Next, uh, next please. And that person was Patrick Swayze, another uh, shocking uh, death of a young man uh, who passed away not too long ago uh, from pancreatic cancer. And um, I did fact check a lot of this information, or at least through Wikipedia, if you call that fact. Uh, so uh, this was very similar to, unfortunately, his presentation of his cancer. Next, next slide, please. So what is uh, ERCP? It's a mouthful, what it stands for, but 
Uh, the procedure itself, again, is a type of endoscopy. We use a thin flexible tube that goes down through the mouth into the intestine where the pancreas drains while you're asleep. And if you imagine a tumor that's grown in the, in the uh, front portion of the, the pancreas, it can compress the bile duct. That's uh, the leftmost picture, that green tube. Uh, by compressing the bile duct, uh, you can no longer drain bile out of the liver, causing a jaundice, that yellowness color, which can preclude us from, from uh, getting chemotherapy if that's the next appropriate step. And so what we can do with this ERCP procedure is using wires and x-ray and other techniques uh, place a biliary stent. That's the most right, right hand picture here on the slide, which looks like a prosthesis, uh, Chinese finger trap, if anyone ever got their finger stuck in one. It really is very similar to that. Um, it can be placed into the duct, expanding across the tumor, allowing the vial to drain out. Next slide, please. Our next case is Mr. A.T. Um, is a 79-year-old man, has a history of one control diabetes, and is being evaluated for six months of uh, vague stomach pain and back pain. On further questioning, he described pale stools, some bloating, um, and uh, diabetes, which normally was well controlled, has suddenly become very poorly controlled. This patient underwent a pancreatic, uh, excuse me, a CAT scan that also unfortunately revealed a mass in the pancreas and multiple masses within the liver. Endoscopic ultrasound again was used to get a diagnosis of pancreatic carcinoma. And Dr. Sowitz mentioned in the beginning of the talk, uh, Mr. Alex Trebek, who very recently passed, um, unfortunately was diagnosed uh, very early on with advanced metastatic pancreatic cancer, uh, very similar uh, fashion to what to what's described in this case vignette. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the reason I thought this was interesting, I wanted to talk a little bit about some signs and symptoms. Again, a very common topic we face with our patients. And overall, unfortunately, there are very few signs and symptoms that allow us to find pancreatic cancer early, making this one of the deadliest diseases, arguably. However, there are some what we call red flags, some markers that tell us, boy, something's going on. Let's look at it further. And um, in general, that's things like appetite um, uh, loss and weight loss, pale stools, stomach pain, usually in the upper stomach and can be radiating to the back, like in the case. Jaundice is a very concerning finding, that yellowness of the skin and eyes and unusual bloating. The one that uh, Dr. Salwitz already alluded to as well earlier was um, diabetes having some uh, possible relationship to, to pancreatic cancer. And the question is a little bit of a chicken or the egg scenario, whether it's pancreatic cancer itself that predisposes to risk or a, 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 to diabetes, excuse me, or is it having diabetes, particularly an atypical form of it uh, that uh, may increase the risk and the likelihood of being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And some of the studies do suggest that somebody who develops pancreatic um, diabetes, excuse me, um, uh, unexpectedly, who otherwise wouldn't be a typical diabetes patient, may have an up to eightfold increased risk of having pancreatic cancer early on. Next slide, please. Am I doing okay on time so far? Relatively okay. Thank you. Um, I, I, I just want to briefly mention when it comes to pancreatic cancer and pain, uh, this is something we really struggle with our patients. Uh, uh, not infrequently, unfortunately, particularly with advanced disease. And in the vignette, we mentioned Mr. Trebek had uh, some back pain that he was struggling with. And there are lots of ways to, to control it. Uh, pain medicine certainly winds up being one of those ways. Treatment itself can be a helpful way to reduce the pain. Uh, but one aspect of endoscopic ultrasound that can sometimes help us control that pain um, is something called celiac plexus neurolysis or even block where we inject medicine into the celiac plexus and innervation area to the pancreas that may give some relief. It's not 100%, but, but can be helpful. Next slide, please. Mr. JC, and I think this is my last, uh, I think this is my last uh, uh, case, the 91 year old male, um, otherwise in good health, reports a family history of two sisters and a brother who passed away early from pancreatic cancer. So very strong genetic component, presumably. Mr. C also has been undergoing CAT scans uh, every three months um, that uh, eventually were converted to MRI screening 
because of uh, uh, hope to avoid radiation uh, in 1977. And an MRI in 2015 and discovered a liver mass in Mr. C um, uh, that turned out eventually after uh, more evaluation to be metastatic myeloma. This patient had uh, been determined with genetic analysis to have a very rare syndrome called familial atypical multiple myeloma. Uh, lots of uh, letters there. Um, and Mr. C was Jimmy Carter, um, which actually is pretty amazing. Uh, he's the longest, excuse me, longest living president today. He's 96 years old, still with us, despite having metastatic melanoma. I, th I thought that was stunning. Um, despite having such a strong family history of pancreatic cancer, but that could be a fringe benefit, I guess, of being, being a president and a former president is he can do things like get CAT scans and MRIs every three months, uh, not worried about uh, fighting with insurance, um, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So I, this is, I think, a good lead-in into discussing briefly screening. Um, I think it's uh, an area that deserves uh, a lot of attention, and there's lots of research, uh, in, uh, particularly out of Mayo Clinic, uh, developing uh, algorithms on how we as physicians can approach screening our patients with pancreatic cancer. Unfortunately, as of today, there really is no ideal screening tool, method, or algorithm. Um, in fact, the federal uh, uh, guideline uh, society, United States Preventive Task Force, which kind of guides us on what we can do, like you know, mammograms and colonoscopies, et cetera, or other screening things, recommends against routine screening for pancreatic cancer in patients who don't have any symptoms. The one caveat is that in those who in very high increased risk, tenfold or higher, there are ways that we can, we can manage to get them screened at a fairly regular interval. And uh, next few slides, I'm gonna describe who that would be. So when we talk about risk assessment, um, there are three main categories, low, moderate, and high. And uh, without going into the detail, it's a lot of detail to go into. And I think most of you have ac will have access to this if you really are interested uh, after the talk. Um, it's broken up into those who have a very strong family history, somewhat strong family history, and then those who have genetic predispositions. Um, I just want to take a moment to address a question that was given to us earlier about IPMN cysts and BRCA mutation. BRCA2 mutation is considered a potential risk for pancreatic cancer. However, without first-degree family members who have had pancreatic cancer, just BRCA2 alone is not considered quite high enough of a risk to warrant very close um, uh, uh, screening. Uh, without any symptoms. That's the, the letter of the law. Uh, the art of, of, of the medicine allows us to, to sometimes get creative in the right setting. And so whoever this patient might be, um, that's something that uh, you can discuss with your doctor in our instances where we can, we can get around it. Um, next slide, please. Wow, okay, that was trippy. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to end uh, uh, with this. Thank you all for, for your time and letting me, letting me speak. Um, when we do uh, decide on screening, the typical approach is, is algorithmic, where we break our patients up into the type of risk. And uh, that was uh, uh, the slide before, uh, giving us a sense of how to do that. And once we determine the type of risk, the doctor then can decide how to best screen them, whether that's MRI uh, when appropriate or endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, with or without some blood work that can help signal early pancreatic cancer. Um, I think that's my last slide. Thank you everyone uh, for letting me speak. Um, I do want to mention, maybe someone else will as well, November is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. I guess that's why we're doing it today. Um, and uh, despite uh, uh, the fact that this can be really quite a frightening diagnosis, there are enormous advances in the area of treatment and surgery. Um, and uh, multifaceted treatment involving both chemotherapy and radiation. And uh, we'll get to hear from, from our colleagues momentarily. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Arkady, thank you very much. Um, that's uh, really a, a ex an excellent review. Uh, much appreciated. Next slide, please. So uh, chemotherapy, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, um, is active in this disease in that it can cause the tumors to shrink 
often uh, a great deal. Um, however, it is not by itself curative. Um, there are cancers that can be cured with uh, chemotherapy by itself, but that is not true of this disease um, ever. Um, chemotherapy, however, is used in multiple different places in the, ther in the therapy of this disease. Um, it's obviously used if someone has a disease that's spread and just uh, is metastatic, but it is also often used um, before surgery. Um, it is often used after surgery, it is often used with radiation. And the point of chemotherapy in each of these settings um, is to shrink the tumor down to make it more sensitive to the other modalities, um, whether it's radiation or to make surgery uh, uh, more successful by making margins clear, shrinking masses, uh, getting the disease under control. Um, so uh, an appropriate next step is having uh, heard uh, how we screen for the disease, uh, how we find the disease, you know, is that critical major uh, curative uh, technology, which is surgery. So I'll turn it over uh, to Tim. Thank you, Dr. Sowitz. I appreciate you giving the opportunity to speak uh, to some of our uh, uh, neighbors about this disease. Um, so next, next slide. As has been touched upon, the uh, pancreas anatomy is uh, challenging given their area it's in and the, and the close proximity to some major mesenteric vessels which supply blood flow to and from your bowels. Um, the pancreas is pictured here, sits in the C loop of the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. And there's uh, the major parts of the pancreas are the head of the pancreas, which is really in uh, close continuity with the duodenum the body of the pancreas, which is the, the uh, straight portion of the pancreas there, and then the very tail of the pancreas, which sits very close proximity to the spleen. Uh, the liver, which produces bile, secretes it down the bile duct, where, where it joins with the pancreatic duct and enters into the small intestine at the ampulla of Vater. So in terms of when, uh, next slide. When a patient is uh, first diagnosed uh, with pancreatic cancer, such as the procedures that Dr. Broder just talked about, the next step is to get a proper staging. The best staging study is a triphasic CT scan uh, looking at the pancreas itself. The first goal with a CT scan is to rule any distant metastatic disease. Unfortunately, over 50% of people who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer have evidence of distant metastatic disease or stage four disease at the time of diagnosis. And so we're looking for on the CAT scan is to confirm that the patient does not have any liver or lung metastasis, that the patient does any distant lymph nodes that are involved, and that the patient has no, no evidence of any peritoneal disease. If the patient does have evidence of metastatic disease, for the most part, surgery is not going to play a role in their treatment, and the patient will be a candidate for systemic therapies, as Dr. Salwitz will discuss. The next thing is you want to look at the location of the tumor. Is the tumor in the pancreatic head or the uncinate process? The uncinate process is the portion of the pancreatic head that is in closest proximity to those major mesenteric vessels, or is the tumor in the pancreatic body and tail? Because depending on if the tumor is in the pancreatic head uncinate process, the patient will be treated with one form of an operation, which I'll discuss, and if it's in the body and tail of the pancreas, it would be a different operation that would be necessary. The other important thing we're looking for um, at the time of the CT scan is the relationship to these major um, mesenteric vessels that, I, that we have several of us have mentioned. The most important vessels are the superior mesenteric vein slash portal vein, based at the major vein which drains the blood flow from your small bowel and exits into the liver. And so the superior mesenteric vein joins with the splenic vein and they form the portal vein. And so that vessel is in very close proximity to the pancreatic head and commonly involved. And there's a major relationship we need to see to determine what extent of surgery may be necessary. That vein being involved itself does not preclude surgery, uh, but certainly makes it a little bit uh, more planning involved in order to remove the disease. There's two other major arterial structures that abut the pancreatic head and body as well. The first one is the celiac trunk, which gives rise to three vessels, the hepatic artery, the left gastric artery, and the splenic artery. The most important one being the hepatic artery, which you want to maintain during surgery. So the relationship of the tumor to the celiac trunk, hepatic artery, is very important as well. And lastly, the superior mesenteric artery, which gives a blood flow to your small bowel, is another structure that sits in very close proximity. And that vessel, uh, can, for the most part, cannot be replaced. And involvement in that vessel makes it a very difficult situation to deal with. Next slide. 
So in general, most patients who get diagnosed with pancreatic cancer should be discussed at a multidisciplinary tumor board. As Dr. Sowitz mentioned, this is one disease where we need critical input from gastroenterologist, pathologist, radiologist, surgical oncologist, medical oncologist, and radiation oncologist. And so at, at these tumor boards, all these represented physicians will be there discussing cases to come up with a multidisciplinary plan for the patient before you even start treatment. Um, almost all patients with a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer these days will be treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There are still some patients who will be candidates for upfront resection, but it's the, the trials and data are pointing towards the idea of giving upfront chemotherapy. Most of the reason is, is that many patients with pancreatic cancer, unfortunately, may have microscopic metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis, which is one of the reasons recurrence rates of pancreatic cancer are quite high. And so the idea behind giving chemotherapy up front is you are giving the best treatment for any microscopic disease that could have spread that you can't see on imaging studies. So most of my patients these days will be treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy for a period of time prior to surgery. The two most common regimens that are utilized these days, as will be discussed by Dr. Sowitz, are fulfirinox, and the second one is gemcitabine or braxane. They've never been compared head-to-head, -head, and either one can be utilized in the treatment plan of a patient with pancreatic cancer. When a patient started on chemotherapy, we watched them prior to surgery in a neo, what's called a neoadjuvant fashion. Uh, we wanted these patients very closely, and that means getting very short interval CT scans, usually every two to three months during therapy to see how the mass is responding. And there's also a tumor marker called the CA199 level, which is elevated in many patients with pancreatic cancer. And when that marker is elevated, we can check that every four to six weeks to see if during treatment, that number is coming down, which would also indicate that the patient is responding to chemotherapy. If the patient's not responding, then we should think about other options, such as switching chemotherapy, um, considering radiation, as Dr. Pepic will talk about, or considering the patient for surgery at that time. In general, Dr. Pepic will talk about the role of radiation in uh, the treatment of pancreatic cancer. It is somewhat controversial and undecided. In general, though, my opinion, if you are going to utilize radiation therapy in the treatment of pancreatic cancer, I would recommend treating it prior to surgery, and that's because you'll be radiating the actual tumor and the margins around the tumor, as opposed to if you give the radiation after surgery, where you're just radiating an area where the tumor was, and you're radiating actually normal tissue that has replaced that area. So if you're going to use radiation, I highly recommend it prior to surgery, if possible. Um, the patients who I definitely recommend radiation prior to surgery are those who are really concerned about not being able to remove the entire tumor. With pancreatic cancer, the number one goal is to remove the entire tumor. You don't want to remove 99% of the tumor, you really need 100% of the tumor removed. And that means when you cut across the different areas where the, where the pancreas is, you need to make sure there's no tumor at that area. And so patients who are very close to those major mesenteric vessels, you should strongly consider radiation therapy prior to surgery. Also, in patients who are concerned about lymph node involvement, those patients will also likely benefit from radiation therapy. But I'll leave that to Dr. Pepic to discuss further. Next slide. So in general, in, in order to determine whether the patient has a resectable pancreatic cancer, there's many um, different definitions out there. And in general, we divide pancreatic cancer patients to one of three things, either resectable, borderline resectable, or locally advanced. Resectable patient means the tumors away from the mesenteric vessels and um, can be resected without the need for any vein or arterial reconstruction. Borderline resectable tumors are those tumors that tend to be in very close proximity to the major mesenteric vessels and even involve them, uh, particularly the vein, and can be considered for surgery, but usually want to shrink it first prior to surgery. And then locally advanced, where tumors are wrapped around the major blood vessels, including the artery, and really surgery is unlikely to play a role unless you get significant shrinkage. Um, one of the areas that's commonly talked about is what defines borderline resectable. You can see here many definitions. You have the NCCN guidelines, the MD Anderson guidelines, the AHPBA or SSO guidelines, and the Alliance guidelines. In general, I tend to go by the Alliance guidelines, which judge that a tumor becomes borderline resectable as you get um, greater than 180 degree involvement of the supermesenteric vein or any loss of interface with the major mesenteric vessel, the SMA, the celiac trunk, or the hepatic artery. Next slide. So once again, resectable disease is tumor with no involvement of adjacent mesenteric vasculature. 
borderline resectable, there's venous involvement, but typically no arterial involvement, no significant arterial involvement. And locally advanced, you have significant venous and arterial involvement, which precludes safe resection. Next slide. I'll show you some pictures of what we're talking about here on a CAT scan. The, the structure labeled T is actually the head of the pancreas, and you can see a hypodense area on, on this picture labeled the T, that is the tumor. And you can see the two structures I labeled there, the superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric artery. And you can see there's a dark area, a, a, a dark area in between the head of the pancreas, it's, it's black on the imaging, in between the head of the pancreas and the tumor and those major vessels. And this was considered a resectable tumor that can be removed with no involvement of those major vessels. But you can see how close it is in proximity in just a regular tumor. So next slide. As these tumors get bigger, you can see once again labeled T, this is a much bigger tumor. And now that area that's labeled SMV or supermetric vein, you can see that about half of that vein is really surrounded by the tumor. And there's a very high chance that this patient would need to have that supermetric vein resected and reconstructed if you took him to surgery. You can see the supermetric artery, however, labeled SMA, is clearly away from the tumor and therefore should not be involved by the tumor. So this patient we consider borderline resectable because they can, the tumor can be removed, but there's a very high chance the patient would need a vein resection. And these patients all will get chemotherapy and likely radiation prior to surgery to see if we can avoid doing a vein resection or at least give the best chance of removing the entire tumor and obtaining a margin negative resection. Next slide. And this is what we refer to as locally advanced. You can once again see the tumor labeled T and this tumor is completely surrounding the superior mesenteric vein and also completely surrounding the superior mesenteric artery. In general, this patient is not going to be a candidate for surgery. That being said, about 10 to 15% of patients with locally advanced disease, the tumor can shrink enough on systemic chemotherapy and radiation therapy that it shrinks to the point where the tumor can become resectable. So about 10 to 15% of patients with locally advanced tumors given sufficient chemotherapy and radiation can achieve a significant response that they do end up going to surgery. And this is why any patient who's not metastatic disease should be very closely followed by a surgeon to see if and when they become eligible for surgery, which is the only way to cure pancreatic cancer in the end. Next slide. So in general, we talked about two types of tumor, head of pancreas tumors and body and tail tumors. Head of pancreas tumors are removed by what's called a pancreatic odontectomy or Whipple procedure. There's two phases to this operation. There's the resection phase and the reconstructive phase, which makes it a bigger operation than many other operations we do as surgical oncologists. The resection phase, you basically have to remove the head of the pancreas, the duodenum, plus or minus the stomach, the distal part of the stomach, which we'll talk about, the common bile duct, and the gallbladder. Now, in general, there's two different types you might hear about. There's the traditional Whipple, which includes removing the duodenum, as well as the distal part of the stomach. And then you have what's called the pylorus preserving Whipple, which other people have named the mini Whipple, which is truly just leaving behind the entire stomach. You don't resect any of the stomach, and you leave a small cuff of duodenum that you sew to, and that's what people refer to as a pylorus preserving operation. There's no data suggesting one operation is better than the other, and it's basically up to the discretion of the surgeon. In general, I do try to do pylorus preserving or mini Whipple uh, when feasible, but if the duodenum is involved, sometimes it's not possible. The next thing is the reconstructive phase. This is where you need to put three organs back together with the intestines once you remove the structures, and I'll show you a picture of this in a second. And the first one's a pancreatic ojejunostomy, connecting the pancreas together with the small intestines. The second one is either a duodenal or gastrojejunostomy, reconnecting the duodenum of the stomach to the intestine. And the last one's a cholidocal jejunostomy, reconnecting the bile duct to the intestines. Next slide. You can see here on the left, this is the area where we divide the structures. You can see the, the dotted black lines where you're dividing the duodenum right after the stomach and the distal duodenum right before the jejunum. You're transecting the pancreas behind the stomach. You can see the dotted line transecting the neck of the pancreas. And then you can see a small line by the bile duct where you're dividing the common bile duct, taking out the gallbladder. The second picture depicts the structures that are removed. That's the head of the pancreas containing the tumor, the duodenum, the distal part of the bile duct and gallbladder all removed. And the third picture, you can see the reconstruction. The pancreas is sutured back together with the intestine. The bile duct is sutured back together with the intestine and the stomach or duodenum is sutured back together with the intestine. 
Next picture. Next slide. Uh, pancreatic body tail tumors. This is usually a more straightforward operation for the most part than a Whipple procedure because you don't need to reconstruct anything. You can remove the tail of the pancreas and don't need to hook, hook it up or connect it to any form of intestine. So there's no anastomosis, which, de which decreases the risk of complications related to the surgery. Um, for a pancreatic body tail tumor, the standard operation is distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy. In general, with pancreatic cancer, there's no role for splenic preservation techniques. The two vessels, as you see in this picture, the, 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 the uh, splenic artery and the splenic vein sit right behind the pancreas, and that's where many of your lymph nodes are around the pancreas, is around those major vessels, the splenic artery and the splenic vein. And so in general, in order to do a proper cancer operation, removal of the surrounding lymph nodes, we do have to take the spleen along with the tail of the pancreas. We then leave the part of the pancreas left behind. Next slide. You can see on the left, once again, you see the tumor in the tail of the pancreas. You see the dotted line representing the area of the pancreas that we transect. We also divide that splenic artery and splenic vein. And you can see on the right, the part of the um, patient that is removed, the tail of the pancreas and the spleen. And you can see the, the um, part of the pancreas we divided. We oversew that with either staples or sutures. And then we go ahead and either staple or suture the splenic artery and splenic vein. And that's a distal pancreatectomy splenectomy. Next uh, slide, thank you. The other two types of operations you may hear about, which are not very common, are total pancreatectomy and a central pancreatectomy. A total pancreatectomy is uncommonly utilized because in general, pancreatic cancer tends to afflict either the head of the pancreas, the body of the pancreas, or the tail of the pancreas. And so generally, you just need to remove part of the pancreas, not the whole pancreas. The tumors very rarely ever come back in the pancreas. So there's no benefit to removing the total pancreas over just part of the pancreas. The real risk of the disease coming back is in lymph nodes or in the liver. And so removing more pancreas is not gonna help you. You just need to get a margin negative resection where there's no tumor at the area you divided. In sometimes you do have to do a total pancreatectomy if you happen to have a very invasive tumor that involves the majority of the gland, but that is uncommon. Or if patients have pre-malignant conditions as Dr. Broda talked about, such as a main duct IPMN, which involves the entire duct, Occasionally, people need a total pancreatectomy for that. Uh, but in general, the total pancreatectomy, the patient has a significant worse quality of life because they are what's called a brittle diabetic, where they need insulin because the body's not able to produce any insulin, which is much more difficult to manage than just general diabetes where patient has some insulin production. The second operation you may hear about, but not done for pancreatic cancer, is a central pancreatectomy. You can see the pictures on the bottom when you have an actual tumor right in the central part of the pancreas or the neck of the pancreas. You can actually divide on either side of it. This would only be done in the case of a cyst or pre-malignant condition. We don't do this operation with pancreatic cancer because you do not resect adequate lymph nodes in order to properly uh, do a cancer operation. And so you can see here, you have to go ahead and oversew one part of the pancreas and the distal part of the pancreas, you have to suture together with the loop of intestine. This operation has more risks because now you have two separate areas of potential complication. You have a leak, you can have a leak from the distal tail of the pancreas. You can also have a leak from the head of the pancreas. So in general, this is an operation just preserved for very select cases of a pre-malignant lesion of the pancreas where you wanna preserve as much pancreas as possible. Next slide. Um, so just a couple more things, uh, minimally invasive surgery, any of these operations I talked about, whether it be a pancreatic adudinectomy or distal pancreatectomy, smectomy, can all be done minimally invasively, either laparoscopic or robotic. You can see here on the left, the pictures of the trocars that are used for either a laparoscopic or robotic approach. On the right, you can see what's the Da Vinci robot, which is the uh, only current robot on the market that is used for this uh, type of operation. Um, which allows us to do this operation much more precisely in a minimally invasive uh, fashion than traditional laparoscopic surgery. Next slide. Um, in general, why would somebody want a minim minimally invasive pancreatectomy? It's less blood loss during the operation because you really have to be able to see with the minimally invasive equipment. So in general, we have less blood loss during the operation. It's a shorter hospital stay, so people tend to get out of the hospital a day or two quicker. Quicker recovery, in general, when you're recovering from a major operation, it takes about four to six weeks. It may shorten down to about three to four weeks with a minimally invasive surgery. There's a low incidence of wound infections and hernias and better cosmesis. You can see on the left, a traditional either Whipple distal pank where you make a midline incision. And on the right, you can see a Whipple where there's smaller incisions with the specimen removed through a suprapubic incision. Next slide. And the last thing I just wanted to talk about was the complications of surgery. 
you can have a leak from any one of the connections. You have a leak from the connection of the pancreas, the jejunum during a Whipple procedure or the bile duct or the stomach. In general, our pancreatic leaks are the most significant and cause us the most issue. And what we worry about most, they happen about 15% of the time and can lead to other complications such as delayed gastric emptying where your stomach just doesn't empty very well. In general, people can return to a very normal quality of life within two months after surgery. The two long-term issues people may have is pancreatic insufficiency, where they may need pancreatic enzymes to help with digestion after the surgery. And the second one is about 10% of people can have worsening diabetes, where they may need increasing doses of either oral hypoglycemics or insulin. Um, and that'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sawitz. And thank you very much. That's a really superb, superb review. Really, I really appreciate it. Next slide, please. Um, as, as Tim mentioned, uh, chemotherapy is uh, very frequently used before surgical approaches. Um, the chemotherapies that you're using are intravenous chemotherapies. They are done generally in the outpatient setting. Um, they're, they, uh, they're either done, uh, one of the, he mentioned was a fulfirinox. Unfortunately, oncologists love these kind of terms. Each of those letters stands for a drug. Um, this is a relatively intensive form of chemotherapy given about every two weeks, partly in the office and partly at home with a pump. Um, it is intensive enough that it can, the patient's general medical health can limit whether or not you can give this therapy, um, despite how effective this can be, the patient has got to be able to tolerate it. So you do have to take into account heart disease, uh, diabetes, uh, not age itself, but the things that come with aging. Um, and then he mentioned also gemabraxine, which is another chemotherapy regimen that's given uh, a little more frequently. Um, and sometimes that may be substituted for Fernox simply because of, to of tolerance. Chemotherapy like this is uh, it's a fair amount of work. It's a lot of back and forth. Um, it does have increased risk of side effects like uh, diarrhea, nausea, fatigue, particularly some increase of infection. And of course, you're already treating someone that has an ongoing medical problem, so you have to balance all those risks. The chemotherapy is given basically to the optimal uh, benefit of the patient, which is to say you can get the most reduction. So you generally giving it between two and six months of therapy. Um, the, uh, to mention that during this time, you have to monitor what's happening very closely because the last thing you want is someone that is borderline receptacle disease and you're giving chemotherapy that may not be giving benefit and maybe giving side effects. So patients are watching very closely during this. And then very critically, often in the middle of this, you be preparing for surgery, um, you, know, you may be looking at radiation therapy. Um, and for that, I asked uh, Josh, Dr. Pavic, if he would uh, discuss radiation therapy in this disease. Great, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks to the East Brunswick Public Library for the opportunity to speak today. And, and thanks to all of you uh, for uh, the opportunity to talk today on radiation therapy for pancreatic cancer. Next slide. So as mentioned, there's about 55,000 uh, cases diagnosed each year, despite significant advances uh, in both chemotherapy uh, and, and surgical uh, approaches. This uh, remains a, a very lethal disease and the fourth leading cause of cancer-related death. Um, the uh, very small minority of these patients, about 15 to 20%, present with uh, initially localized and resectable disease up front. The large majority of patients either present with metastatic disease or uh, borderline resectable or unresectable disease. Uh, pancreatic cancer has been associated with very high rates of local recurrence. Um, typically, however, that's been overshadowed by very high rates of distant spread, distant metastatic disease uh, for patients. Now, there have been a number of advances in multidrug therapies that have shown improved efficacy, um, either for patients with localized disease and especially in the metastatic setting, and which is also why local control becomes increasingly important. Many studies have shown that the risk of local recurrence is anywhere from about 30 to 40% uh, of uh, patients um, after surgery. So, so local control certainly matters, and, and radiation being a localized treatment, this is certainly where we may come in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as stressed with um, all of the uh, speakers before me, uh, treatment for pancreatic cancer really is, is best done with a multidisciplinary approach with both GI, radiology, pathology, surgical oncology, medical oncology, as well as radiation oncology. And in determining optimal treatment approaches for patients who are either uh, resectable, uh, potentially curable disease, locally advanced disease, and or uh, metastatic disease. Now, um, important to note, as Dr. Kennedy mentioned, that the role for radiation therapy for select patients still is uh, a topic of controversy, um, especially for patients who have resected 
or uh, resectable disease. And we are now seeing them postoperatively. Uh, next slide. So um, in, in addressing patients who have had upfront surgery, um, which there is a small percentage of patients who we see, um, the, the controversy is, is uh, it's really a, co a continental divide uh, difference uh, between both the European and American approach in terms of um, how pancreatic is, treat is treated in the adjuvant setting. Um, older US studies have shown that postoperative radiation and chemotherapy, usually with a, a, a drug 5-fluorouracil or gemcitabine has shown improved survival and disease-free survival for patients who had upfront resection. Um, there's also been some pooled single institutional studies from both Johns Hopkins and Mayo Clinic that also showed an improvement in survival uh, for patients who received post-operative chemotherapy and radiation. However, uh, there have been a number of European studies that have shown no benefit with the addition of post-operative uh, radiation and chemotherapy. And this is really where the controversy lies. Um, there is a uh, recent US study from the Radiation Therapy Oncology Group uh, which is looking to try to better address this question here in the United States. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the American Society of Radiation Oncology, or ASTRO, um, recently put together a, a national uh, task force working group, um, which I was a part of, that uh, attempted to establish guidelines for patients with, uh, with pancreatic cancer and who would best benefit from radiation therapy. Uh, these guidelines were published in 2019, and at least for those with resected pancreatic cancer, uh, chemotherapy and radiation is something that should be considered uh, postoperatively for patients with pancreatic cancer, especially for those who have high-risk features, either positive lymph nodes at the time of surgery or patients who have a margin that is positive after surgical resection. In these cases, radiation therapy is usually a daily treatment, Monday through Friday. Um, over about five to six weeks. Um, systemic therapy, however, in these patients is key, um, which is why adjuvant chemotherapy usually is the first thing that is delivered. Uh, and radiation therapy is usually given anywhere from three to six months after uh, delivery of post-operative chemotherapy, assuming that patients have no evidence of metastatic disease on any restaging studies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as Dr. Kennedy outlined, uh, there are a number of definitions for uh, patients with both borderline and unresectable pancreatic cancer. This is one of the definitions from the NCCN. Um, the, the key is that defining resectability is largely based on the relationship of the tumor to the adjacent vasculature. Uh, next slide. So, um, the, the prognosis for these patients, uh, for both borderline and unresectable patients, is largely determined on whether or not these patients can get to surgery. Um, the prognosis for those who do go to surgery is largely based on their surgical margin status at the time of resection. So patients who either have microscopically positive disease, which we refer to as an R1 resection, or gross residual disease, um, an R2 resection after surgery historically have poor outcomes. And as Dr. Kennedy mentioned, um, the goal for any of our treatment is, is not to get out 99% of the tumor, we need to get 100% of this tumor out. So patient selection for surgical resection is critically important upfront with a goal of achieving a resection with negative margins with no evidence of cancer left behind, what we refer to as an R0 resection. This is where the, the uh, consideration for preoperative or neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, is considered for patients who are both borderline resectable um, or, or locally advanced, which we'll touch on in a minute. These patients usually are treated with a, a course of chemotherapy up front and then considered for either chemotherapy and radiation or radiation therapy alone um, after a, a chemotherapy course. Um, Patients who are best considered for uh, this neoadjuvant approach are patients who either have borderline resectable disease defined by that relationship to the adjacent vasculature or who have suspicious localized lymph nodes at the time of their diagnosis. Now, the, the benefit of this neoadjuvant approach is allowing for tumor downstaging, shrinking this tumor down to make it more amenable to surgical resection. 
also identifying the patients who are uh, most appropriate for surgical resection. It is a big surgery. Uh, and there are patients who have microscopic metastatic disease um, at presentation. Um, and we don't wanna have anybody go through such a surgery if, if there is a metastatic disease that is just uh, undetectable based on our imaging, but, but may uh, pop up at a later date after their neoadjuvant uh, course. Uh, next slide. Um, so for those with unresectable disease, for the vast majority of these patients, uh, surgery is not recommended. Um, next slide. Um, so for either borderline resectable or unresectable disease, as mentioned, a course of chemotherapy and consideration for either chemotherapy and radiation, um, usually over five to six weeks, or a short course of radiation therapy alone is considered. Um, the more conventionally fractionated course of, chemo of radiation over five to six weeks is given with chemotherapy, as mentioned, usually with a drug called 5-fluorouracil, um, which can be given either intravenously or there's an oral uh, form of that, something called capecitabine, um, which we give with radiation, or gemcitabine, uh, which is an intravenous uh, drug uh, delivered by medical oncology. Um, this is another type of treatment course that can also be delivered for patients who are unresectable at the time of their diagnosis. Um, there is another course of radiation therapy called stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SBRT, um, also seen in the literature as uh, stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy, or SABR, is a uh, regimen that has been increasingly utilized for patients with either borderline resectable or locally advanced disease. These are patients who uh, are given any, usually five fractions of radiation therapy over about a week to a week and a half of uh, treatment. Um, the, this is just very precise treatment just delivered to the tumor alone. This is generally not a, a, an optimal regimen for patients who have suspicious lymph nodes uh, in the adjacent area. Um, studies that have looked at this approach do show promising local control rates, acceptable toxicity, um, and, and encouraging rates of, of downstaging to allow for, for surgery. And, and the benefit of this approach is uh, significantly reducing the, the length of time patients are going through radiation therapy. Um, radiation is also used for palliation uh, in the metastatic disease setting. Um, for durable control or also if patients are developing uh, any uh, pain associated with the primary tumor, uh, radiation usually over a short course of treatment, um, as many as two weeks, uh, can sometimes be safely uh, delivered uh, to try to relieve symptoms. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is just uh, two representative slices of uh, that treatment I described, uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy, the uh, colored lines around the tumor represent uh, isodose lines. These are uh, dose levels of radiation delivered. Again, this just demonstrates a very highly conformal, uh, very precise uh, dose of radiation delivered to the uh, pancreatic tumor and uh, that tumor vessel interface, which is so critical in achieving a, uh, a negative resection at the time of surgery. Uh, next slide. Uh, and that should be good for me. Thank you. Josh, thank you very much. That's a really excellent review. So um, finally, so we've heard that you know, chemotherapy has a role uh, before a surgical resection to reduce disease, either with or without radiation. Um, you may should also understand that if patients have surgical uh, have resection and haven't had any aging chemotherapy, there is also a role for chemotherapy for six months after that you know, resection um, in individual patients. Um, unfortunately, uh, as we've discussed, um, this is a disease. Next slide, please. Um, which um, we don't, uh, many patients present with advanced disease or the disease uh, may occur despite you know, aggressive measures. Um, and uh, an inordinate number of our patients um, eventually do die from this disease. Um, chemotherapy um, and to and now more beginning uh, uh, immunotherapies um, do have a role in this period of a patient's life. Um, I think these therapies should be looked on as being palliative and that is two things. One, improving 
quality of life and trying to extend life. Um, they are not curative. Um, once this disease um, has, you know, has recurred either in the abdomen, in the liver, somewhere else. Um, we, uh, in choosing these drugs uh, and these therapies, oncologists um, should be trying to optimize the patient's performance, ability to live their lives, to get out and function. Um, this is not the idea is not to give someone such intensive, overwhelming treatment um, that it, um, you know, that it debilitates them, the therapy itself, it should be improving upon them. Um, the chemotherapies uh, can be designed um, looking at some of the genetics of the tumor itself. Uh, there are certain drugs that can be optimized in certain genetic situations in terms of genetic the tumor. Or even if someone, for example, we talked about BRCA early, um, there are you know, drugs, uh, lapinib, which is you know, a PARP inhibitor, which specifically works in individuals that have a BRCA inhibitor, uh, a BRCA um, mutation. Um, but again, the goal of these therapies is to extend survival, improve survival, you know, and in working, you know, with the oncologist, you know, patients should be aware of that and also should be optimized what their goals are. You know, uh, we think we saw with Alex Trebek, you know, he presented with advanced disease, chemotherapy, extended disease, his, his survival was probably, probably a year and a half. Um, and um, so the, these therapies do work in individual patients, it may be longer than that. Um, it also may be individual things that happen along the way, perhaps a particular tumor that can receive radiation. Uh, you know, there are certain things you can do to improve the case, but the therapy of chemotherapy, which is generally given as an outpatient, um, some of it's oral, a lot of it's IV, you know, is to optimize and survive, you know, survival going, going forward here. Um, I point on the slide here, and I really should have started with this whole thing in pointing this out here. You know, this is an area that a lot of change is happening, a lot of discovery, um, and patients should be asking at every portion of the course, you know, what are the research trials that are available to me? Um, you know, what are the studies I could participate in? You know, what are, is there particular things that we can learn, you know, not in my, me in my case, but they give me uh, access to therapies that might not otherwise be available. And you should be asking your clinicians, you know, what are the research studies that I should be involved in, or is there something for my particular case? You know, and not only is this critical for discovery going forward, but also the individual patient, you know, may make, you know, a, a significant difference. Next slide, please. I think we've I, I actually mentioned a number of these pieces here in the slide, so I'll be extraordinarily brief. I mean, this is a disease that can cause a lot of different symptoms and problems. And these should be addressed um, specifically. I mean, it's, you shouldn't be, shouldn't just be having these problems as a side thing or hoping the chemotherapy will get them better. And we have, you know, uh, you know uh, Arcadia mentioned the use of uh, celiac blocks, you know, nerve blocks to try to uh, uh, treat the pain locally. I mean, there can be, you know, a lot of benefit as well as multiple different drugs. Um, we have to be big fans of medical marijuana for a lot of the symptoms in cancer patients and have had a lot of luck with both, many of the symptoms actually that pa patients get. Um, there's a significant increased risk of blood clots um, pancreatic cancer, and there are a number of authors who recommend these patients uh, with disease be put on blood thinners, even if they haven't had blood clots, but certainly if they have had blood clots, need to be on blood thinners, which again is balancing risk of blood thinners versus risk of bleeding, but it's important. Uh, you know, loss of weight, which is not only debilitating, you know, for the patient, et cetera, but also increase the risk of other infections and problems, you know, is important. And there are a number of different measures we adjust to that. Jaundice, during yellow, is addressed early uh, with many of the ways that uh, uh, Arcadia mentioned. If you develop fluid in the abdomen, this can be drained. Again, it's about symptoms improving. And then the reality is um, this is a disease which is, uh, can be debilitating. Um, it's, it's hard, very hard to have a disease which can't be cured even if you can palliate it, extend life for a period of time, so that's depressing. And then the reality is that this disease by itself medically um, seems to cause uh, depression in a, in, a number, in a number of patients. I mean, he, patients with pancreatic cancer will at times just present depressed and you can't figure out why. And it turns out that this, drug, this disease apparently as a phenomenon of the cancer, what we call perineoplastic, um, can cause depression. And these things can be treated. I mean, either by, by medications, by support, by counseling. I mean, obviously this is a disease that the family goes through together and pulling together, particularly in this COVID time that makes it even harder. But those things should be specifically, specifically addressed. Next slide, please. You know, so um, this, uh, wrap, you know, this uh, wraps up our presentation for today. There were a couple of questions that, um, that we um, received, um, uh, which are relatively brief. But one of them was just the ID question about, should we just be genetically screening everyone? <laughs> and this is, of course, an area that 
healthcare in general is going to. I mean, so far we don't have a recommendation in general to that everybody should get genetic screening, but I will say we're getting closer and closer to that. Certainly if there are family risk factors concerns and genetic screening is more and more available and where our trigger to order genetic screening just an otherwise healthy individual is getting lower. Um, so um, I mean that more and more headed in that direction, but not yet, but certainly if there are family risk. Um, Arkady, there was a, a question. Um, uh, you know, that uh, should BRCA1 uh, patients be seen as high risk as opposed to BRCA2? I think on your slide, you mentioned both, but I, I think it wasn't clear. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, uh, but both BRCA1 and, and BRCA2 are considered at, at an increased risk. There's a slightly higher risk with BRCA2 for pancreas specifically, but, but neither one alone uh, has a clear textbook guideline for screening. And so if there's family history of pancreatic cancer or other conditions and a BRCA carrier state, meaning the patient has one of the BRCA genetic uh, abnormalities, then, then it's uh, straightforward more or less to screen them. Uh, but as I may have mentioned earlier, you know, that, that is the the science of medicine, uh, the art of medicine is uh, we understand the extreme uh, anxiety that uh, being a gene carrier that predisposes all sorts of malignancies uh, can cause for our patients. And we've worked with insurance companies uh, to do things reasonably, you know, without putting the patient in harm's way to maybe get an MRI or something. Uh, to get a screening test when appropriate. So I say that just so if you have a particular concern, speak with your physician um, and see if uh, you may qualify for screening. Thank you very much. So uh, just finally, if uh, this seems to be a confusing topic to you um, because there's so many pieces to coming at so many angles, this is why I started with the comment, this is a disease that should be uh, approached from a multidisciplinary uh, fashion. Um, and the clinicians obviously should be communicating. Uh, you know, Dr. Kennedy uh, mentioned, you know, uh, uh, tumor boards, you know, and multidisciplinary uh, you know, uh, working together. I mean, that's really critically important, and that's how we come to the answers for each individual patient in a complex disease such as such as this. Um, uh, and it's critically important going forward. So thank you all for uh, being here uh, today uh, for uh, St. Peter's Hospital, Roger Kansas Institute, uh, Prince of Radiation Ecology, RCCA. You know, we uh, hope that you stay safe, uh, stay healthy, um, you know, and you know, we uh, go forward together. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salitz, Dr. Pepek, Dr. Kennedy, and Dr. Broder for taking the time to present on this topic and to answer all of our questions. And the next topic in this series is Life After Cancer on Friday, December 4th at 12 p.m. noon. And Dr. Broder will be doing another Lunch and Learn with the doctors with East Brunswick Library on December 18th at 12 p.m. noon. And that topic will be on a colon polyp screening. So thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's talk and take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.